word exile. It means being a stranger in a strange land, a place where you lose one's sense of time and, and place. And many people who follow Christ in this current world in which we live have such a sense of being in uncharted territory. Where are we headed? What's our purpose? How do we navigate in a world that just doesn't feel at home? It feels so completely strange. We feel like absolute aliens in our own culture and time. Well, there was a place in Israel's history where they felt the same way, even to the point of the concerns they had that they may f lose their own homeland. And their answers and the encouragement and the, and the warnings and all of that came to them from God through what we call prophets. Prophets are those who were the mouthpiece of God and to the people, whereas priests represented people back to God. But the prophets came to people in, in this time and, and shared his truth and his message with them. When we open their books and their writings today, we find that their message speaks so much of God's character, of what God is doing and how he can be trusted, even in a crazy world and in a place and a time where you feel like you're living in exile. And as we learn from them and as we trust in that message and find its timeless truth applicable to our time and our day, we can be people who learn what it means to live, well, with an, a faith that's off the charts, even in a world that seems to be uncharted. And so this series will take us through, to some extent, what are some more remote portions of Scripture and the minor prophets and some section of the, the, the four major prophets. And so today we turn to the book of Amos. To the book of Amos. You probably haven't had your devotions lately that much in the book of Amos. And well, maybe we'll give you a different flavor and a feel for this great prophet of antiquity. Now, we've been sorting out the prophets, you know. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, Joel, Amos, Nobody, I, Jeremiah, Ganem, Back, Stephen, I, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Those guys? Okay, we've been sorting them out for you along the way. And we have this chart for you that we'll throw up here from time to time. And you can see it also uh, online and follow along to see where the different prophets are. We already started and talked about the one prophet that was to the nation of Edom. Some of the prophets were for the northern kingdom of Israel, some for the southern kingdom, some for some of the nations around. So we talked about Obadiah in our first time together. In the future, we'll be talking about Jonah and Nahum, who was a prophet to Assyria. That was the first world empire that took the northern ten tribes of Israel into captivity. So when we talk about exile, though, we're talking about the southern two tribes of Judah and how they were taken to Babylon in captivity. So before those exiles to Israel was Hosea and Amos. That's who we talk about today. And so you see where he fits in with some of the other prophets like Ezekiel and Daniel. Of course, they're talking about the time when the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, is in exile in Babylon and ultimately the people would be returned into the land. But Amos, as we think about Amos, Amos was a prophet specifically from the southern kingdom, the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. That's where he was from, but he was sent by God particularly to prophesy to the ten northern tribes of Israel. Though in his, the course of his prophetic messages that he had from God that he delivered, he had pronouncements that were first and foremost for the northern tribes, but there were some as well that spoke uh, of a coming uh, difficult time for the southern tribes because of their unbelief and, and their lack of trust for God. And there were multiple prophecies as well to the varied nations and entities and people groups around. But specifically, it was to the, to the northern tribe. Uh, we pick up with the first uh, verse in, in, in Amos. It says, The word of Amos, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel, in the two years before the earthquake, now we don't know what earthquake this is talking about, but there must have been a big one because it's talked about a couple of other times. But it was when Uzziah was the king in Judah and Jeroboam, the son of Joash, was the king in Israel. So this sort of pinpoints about the time where this happened, when this happened. And so it would be, if you give it a year, about 760 B.C. This would be about 38 years roughly before the northern ten tribes of Israel would be taken away to captivity into the Assyrian Empire with its capital city uh, of Damascus. So Amos was, when we think of Amos, Amos is, he's just a good old boy. 
you know, of the prophets. This is the good old boy and prophet. Not a guy with a seminary background. Not a guy with a pedigree from the priestly ranks. God just called an ordinary kind of a guy and used him. You might think of him a little bit as like the Duck Dynasty guy of the prophets, all right? Just an average kind of sort of ordinary guy, an earthy guy, because so many of the stories that he uses and the illustrations that he uses are from ordinary life uh, experiences. And uh, like one of them talks about a a plumb line, Aaron. So he's he's your kind of guy, square, you know? And, And so, and Israel was found not to be, and we don't have that passage today, but Israel was found to be off a square. So that's one of his illustrations, sort of just an, an earthy kind of guy. You know, when I think of, actually, when I think of Amos, my mental picture of Amos is actually my father. My father grew up on a farm in, uh, in New Jersey. I mean, he did the plowing with the horses and, 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 and the whole thing. I mean, that's that far back. And, and so he was just a, a, a guy, a, just a farming guy like Amos. And my father, it was so funny because when he gave you directions to go any place, it's not like, you know what Hagerstown people, do you know what you people do? I'm going to call you you people because I'm from New Jersey. You know how you people give directions around here? Where something used to be, you know, where the old Lowe's was or whatever. And when you're new in town, it doesn't do you a bit of good. That's the way everybody gives directions here. And to prove that I'm one of you, I find myself doing it all the time. It's where something used to be. Okay, now, my father, he gave directions. He said, you go about, you go down the road a ways, and you'll go past an alpha, alpha field, and then you'll see a field with, with, with about a dozen heifers. And that's where you'll turn right, okay? And, and so that's what I think of when I think of Amos, an earthy kind of guy of the land. And uh, so he served during a time, and the king that's being referred here to, there are two kings. The second of those kings is Jeroboam the second, And so that helps us pinpoint the exact time that this was near the end of the reign of uh, the northern kingdom before they're taken into captivity. Let's go to chapter 7. I'm going to read a little more about uh, Hosea here in chapter 7, starting with verse 10. Chapter 7, verse 10. We'll read through verse 17. It says, Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Okay, now what's going on here? We're talking about Israel here. Again, it's talking about these northern ten tribes that were a separate kingdom. The southern two tribes of Judah, where's Jerusalem? Jerusalem is in the south. So they had set up their own worship system in the north, a place to gather. They had their own sort of priests and, and, and that kind of, and, and religious leadership. And that's this guy. This guy is the number one dog here during the time of Jeroboam. And he's getting the story of, uh, that there's this prophet fellow going around. He's rabble-rousing. He's setting up people against the king. And some people are kind of listening. He's just causing trouble. And he's saying that Jeroboam's in trouble. He's going to die by the sword. And so the priest is going to the king and saying, you know, you got this problem here going on in your kingdom so Amaziah said to Amos verse 12 get out get out of here you seer go back to the land of Judah so in other words go south go back to the southern kingdom earn your bread there do your prophesying there don't prophesy anymore Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of his kingdom in other words who do you think you are hanging out up here and coming and saying these things look if you want to make trouble go back to your own country and make trouble Well, verse 14, Amos answered Amaziah. I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. So that's where that phrase comes from. You ever hear the people say, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet? I've said that. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. But I do work for a nonprofit agency. Okay, so this is where it comes from. So he's not a prophet, the son of a prophet, he says. uh, But I was a shepherd, and I took care of sycamore, fig trees. It's kind of a Tim Thorpe kind of guy, all right? So that's kind of how he was. And, uh, and, but the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the descendants of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city. That's the kind of destruction that will be there. Your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country, and Israel will surely go into exile 
away from their native land. And so he has a very negative message. You can imagine the politicians, even back in those days, didn't like people coming along and saying things like this about what was going on in the kingdom. So his message was very annoying to the king and to the leadership. And Amos himself was despised, as so many of the prophets were. You see in the, Old, in the New Testament, rather, where Christ talks to the people about the prophets. He often talks about the prophets that God sent and how, how they were despised and, and, how, and how their message was rejected. And so his message was ignored because it was a message that was too difficult to believe, because it caused too much introspection, because, well, honestly, things were going quite well at the time. Commerce thrived. There was an upper class that had emerged. Expensive homes were being built. And there are varied passages throughout Amos that talk about this. And again, you track with us online in the coming week. Our whole coming week devotional series online will be looking a little deeper into Amos than we're able to do today. So I invite you to check that out and be a part of it with us in the coming week. But uh, things were going well. Uh, People were living a rich and indulgent lifestyle. The poor became, though, targets for legal and economic exploitation. Slavery for debt was easily accepted, and morality standards had sunk to a new all-time low. But there was prosperity. But along with this, there was religious activity. The people went through perfunctory sorts of actions and, and, and deeds and duties. And, 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 but there was a sense, even with faith, that all was well. There was a certain amount of religious duty, but an arrogance that went with it because they figured, we're God's people. We know. We're okay. We're God's people. We're Israel. We're Israel. Look what he did in our history. It's okay. We're going to be okay. God is not going to judge us. We're, We're his folks, you know. But God's message was about their religious observances and that they were not in accord with righteous living. The way that they lived their lives and the way that they expressed their faith were completely out of sync with each other. And going to chapter 5 now of Amos, we find that the Lord found this actually rather nauseous. He says, verse 21 to 24 of chapter 5, he says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. So this is Amos speaking as God speaking to, as it were, God speaking to the people. I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring me choice fellowship offerings, I'll have no regard for them. Away with the whole noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-rolling stream. So I'm sick of your songs, I'm sick of your worship. It's not genuine, it's not real. Hey, what about the topic here of justice? That's what should be going on and, and rolling on. The Israelites had what we might call first world problems. And that's our title today within this series. First world problems. You know, we throw the phrase around. We talk about folks who live in the third world. Or we might see a say of someone who's a missionary to a, to a third world country. Well, where'd that phrase come from? Do you ever think, well, what's the first world and what's the second world? I know we talk about the third world. Well, this came out of the, the Cold War era. We talked about Western uh, industrialized nations as the first world. The second world was kind of a Soviet bloc type of nations. And then the third world was sort of the developing world. And we kind of forgot to talk about the first two. But we think about third world. We think about places that are remote, places uh, where industrialization has not um, had its ha- had a, f- a full uh, experience and so on. But we have first world problems. And now, when the phrase first world is talked about, or first world problems is talked about, it's kind of an ironic way of poking fun at the human tendency to complain about things, despite living in comparative luxury. It's kind of like two rich guys complaining about um, you know, the, the poor features that they dislike about their latest model BMWs or something like that, you know. And, and so, uh, you know, I had this very unusual experience in my earlier life, in my mid-twenties of living in Dallas and being a minister of music in a, in a pretty sizable church there where it was just 
filled with very, very wealthy people. Uh, I haven't had that experience since then, and, uh, but it, it was a unique, unique experience of my life, and it was, it was truly a, a lot of fun in many ways, and I'm going to sound like I'm being negative about these folks. These folks were incredibly, incredibly generous. I mean, they just gave away millions of dollars to all kinds of causes and that sort of thing. But for those of us who were on the pastoral staff, the ministry staff, we were about half of us were still seminary students. The others were, were well, guys like, say, like I am now. You know, it's about half and half. But none of us had come from, you know, wealth. And, and it, it, so we just kind of uh, would, would enjoy in staff meetings kind of reflecting on some of the things we would hear and the things that, that folks would say. Uh, because some of the biggest problems that they faced in their life were things like finding, you know, reliable maids and servants and groundskeepers and pool people and, 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 and people who could take care of uh, the varied properties that they owned both in Dallas and in Colorado where they had ski resort properties. And, and, and how do you deal with this? I mean, how do you, it was like a burden to have to deal with all these things. And, and many of them, they would have so many cars and vehicles that they would actually employ a person full time who would take care of their fleet of vehicles for them and just kind of um, spent their day just kind of making sure everything was everything was running and all the equipment that they owned and, and, and but getting the right folks to do this I mean these are the kinds of things that they had going on They're, you know the way we would look at something like that you know it, it, I, do any of you have that experience I know the answer to that I know the answer to that you know we look at that and we, 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 we chuckle about folks who have those what's we mean by first world problems you know, but in the same way, though truly not any of us here are wealthy by the kinds of standards I've described, from a third world, as we think of a third world, well, we, the way we use that, from a third world point of view, as they would look back at us and look back at the lifestyles that are typical of those of us who have gathered here today, who live in this tri-state area, we look very much the same to them as the rich folk I've described in Dallas would look to us. We actually have things like windows and doors in our homes. We have electricity. We have indoor plumbing. We have cell phones. We have hundreds of other life amenities that are absolutely beyond the imagination or experience of millions and millions of people around the world. And so we can have as well, even in our culture, even in our socioeconomic environment in which we live and move, a first world problem. problem. In Amos, the people are condemned for their trust in possessions and failing to be a people who are a blessing to the poor and a blessing to those who are in the surrounding nations around them. Few things are as anesthetizing in our lives as pleasure and wealth. And God's message to Amos was a simple one. See past the apathy that comes with privilege. Learn to love your neighbor. See past the apathy that comes with privilege. Learn to love your neighbor. That's what the book of Amos is all about. The gospel is that which provokes us to love with the same sacrificial love which we have been loved by God, which we have been shown. And it makes us able to uh, not have to, to, to approach God based on our performance, but because of God's grace. We've experienced that grace. And that grace and the gospel message changes the way we see ourselves. And it changes the way that we view others. Truly, we are one set of beggars helping other beggars find where the bread is. What I'd like to do quickly is just give you a chart of four things to quickly draw some comparisons between the message of the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament message that we have in the gospel and in the completed work of Christ in the building of what we know as his body, the church of Jesus Christ. The first thing is to say this, that as in the Old Testament of Israel, and so in the church of Jesus Christ, all of us have been chosen by grace. We have been chosen by God, I should say. Both Israel and the church, we are <clears throat> chosen by God. It says in the book of Amos, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Hear this word, people of Israel. The Lord, the word of the Lord has spoken against you, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. In multiple times in the Old Testament, you may remember it was a year ago right now, we talked through the book of, of uh, Deuteronomy. 
in, the, in this, the Revive series that we had. And you may recall from that and from multiple passages in the Old Testament where the Lord looks at Israel and says, of all the nations of the earth, I have chosen you. And of all the people, as we go to a New Testament, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, of all the people in, in the world, God has chosen us. Now, that gets into some hairy theological kinds of things, but the scriptures talk about election. It talks about choosing. And that's what those words mean. How, what it's based on is what the argument's about. In any way, we are a blessed people by God's grace. In Ephesians 2, it says this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead and transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So it doesn't matter you're talking Old Testament, you're talking New Testament. The people who are God's people are God's people because they were chosen by God. That's the first thing to say. Here's the second thing. Both Israel and the church are warned not to think too highly of self, to have a sober attitude towards self. It says in Deuteronomy 7, The Lord did not set his affection upon you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand, redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, commanding and keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. And so he says to Israel, remember he said when they went into the land, remember who got you here, remember what brought you here, remember how by a strong hand I have taken down the defenses, I have given it to you. Don't go to a point where you say, look what I have done, look how we have built this and made this and all of that. It was already prepared for them. They just came in and, and conquered it and took it over. Vineyards they didn't plant, houses they didn't build. It was all by God's grace that they had what they had. They were chosen and they had God's grace. Same way in the New Testament. We're chosen by God and his love set upon us and we have his grace and therefore we should not think very highly of ourselves. What would be the passage for that? Of course, 1 Corinthians in chapter 1 where the exhortation in verse 26 to 31 is this. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly ones of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So, we are called by God. And we are called by God by his grace. Being called by God by his grace, and in no merit that we have of our own, whether you're talking Old Testament or New Testament, we ought to be people who are humble and don't think too highly of ourselves compared to the status of others around us. A third point to make is this that God had a ministry for Israel as a chosen nation, and he has a ministry for the church as his elect and people. In the Old Testament, the ministry he said to the give, and he gave to them, we see it in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The nation of Israel was to be a missionary nation to the nations around. They weren't, just they weren't supposed to just kind of have God's grace and say, yo, we be number one here, the number, you know, the big finger. That's who we are. We're number one. God chose us. They were to proclaim this to the nations around, and they never really did that. They had a ministry to be an, a people of outreach Likewise, God's chosen people, the church in the New Testament, have such a ministry. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, it says, You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Hear all those Old Testament themes coming in? 
you're God's special possession, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We have been blessed to be a blessing. We have truth that we may share it with others. That all that we have is from God and is all to be used, as it were, to outreach to others around and beyond us. And that's the fourth point. With prosperity comes responsibility to lovingly consider the needs of others with a desire for justice, for human dignity. Yes, with responsibility, with, with opportunity, with prosperity, with blessing comes that responsibility. As Jesus said, to whom much has been given, much will be required. By any standard, we all have been given much. We've been given plenty to be rich toward the rest of the world around us. And how do we do that? How do we display that? I'd love to take a whole long time in talking about that. We'll flesh it out more in our written materials this week. But of course, as we think through and, and kind of where are we to be responsible to take what we have and to make sure that it meets the needs of others around us. Well, of course, we'll take five things. It starts with our home and with our family. The scriptures are full of, of, of the exhortations that you take care of your own. Secondly, beyond that, in the New Testament economy, we're to be faithful to the institution of God's work in the world today, and that is the church, the local church. We're commanded to love one another. In the process of loving one another, we need to be people supporting each other in, in every way possible. We think of widows. We think of orphans. We think of people with needs, and we consider how our responsibilities in a financial way relate into that. And as you know, we've, we've helped one of our families move across the country because that was a sense of responsibility biblically that we had to serve and to help others. Uh, Arnold and Julie are here today. They can tell you their experiences of moving across the country here in the last week. That's just one example. So our homes are within the church family. Thirdly, to the global church, to the work of Christ around the work, such as Amy shared with us today, and a heart as well for the persecuted church around the world. And then fourthly, uh, thinking beyond the Christian community and out there to the local community, to the unsaved world that is around us. The scriptures say that we are to be eager to do what is good out there in, in the world around us. And there are so many ways that we can connect in the world around us and be missional. We talk so much here about being missional people. And so many of you do that. I'm so proud of the ministries that we do of that sort. We can do more of those. And then finally, to the world, thinking beyond of just the, the whole world and the human needs that are out there in the whole world in ways that we can be a part of meeting those needs. So as we finish today, even as we live in a troubled time, like the Old Testament prophets, and even as we find our faith and our experience in these troubled times, to often be out of step with the culture and the world around us. In spite of all of that, if we're not mindful of the issues of caring for human need and social justice near and far, we may find ourselves not just out of step with the culture, but out of step with the heart of God. And that's not what we want to be. We understand we're going to be out of step with the culture, but let not our out of step with the culture lead us to be out of step with God's heart and with God's clear word in multiple ways that we be generous people to others around us in these varied spheres of which we've spoken. And so when we come to you, uh, as we do almost every week, with a whole list of, of opportunities and things, what we are doing is giving you opportunities and us together as a family of faith to participate in these kinds of things that God is doing. And so we can participate with Amy in Spain today. We're talking about that. I encourage that some of you will want to do that. You want to do that personally. We do it corporately as a church. I'm sure many of you do personally. Uh, do that. Do that. Have missions folk that you support and personally. We have a project in Haiti. We think about that. Down uh, The folks who are down there. The pregnancy center ministry is a way of having an impact in, in a practical way in our community where the gospel can go along with it. The Valentine's project is one where we, we have a heart to reach out to widows and widowers at this time of year and, and, and to have a caring uh, t touch and connection with them that may open doors for, for greater and, and, and more specific ministry. And then 
we have so much, so many ways in which we can uh, participate in, in a benevolence way and through the, the benevolence fund that we have and, and just help people in need. And we draw your attention to that on a regular basis as well. So let us do these things. Let us, let us see these as not just peripheral things that the church is kind of throwing out there because they, they, the people come and they got these needs and they feel called to go here and they want to do this project and so we throw it out there and, 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 and these people and they got these needs and, and I'll tell you the biggest one of them all that we can be involved in right now coming up starting a week from today is with the reach the shelter you heard some of the needs some of the opportunities that are there if you can help with some of that and you haven't signed up you haven't been a part of it see Tim today that's a way of making a dent in the world out there uh, for the Lord and walking in step with him and with his heart that we not be people that just satisfy ourselves that is so much where the current world is the church where the Christian community is at right now in so many choices that are being made in churches and in Christian communities so much of the focus is on what meets my needs what satisfies me what music satisfies me what preaching satisfies me what the uh, group satisfy me what teaching what kids ministries what you know what what and, and how does it how does it how does it come back how does it come back to me how does it come back and when god would have us i think to prioritize and say how can i be a funnel of what god has given me to be a blessing and make dents out there in the world for him along with these people how can i jump in and help in this place to be a giving person uh in the spirit of of all that the lord has given to us having chosen me by grace, having blessed me, and now given me the opportunity to serve. Let's be others focused. And in doing that, we are walking in step with God, even if we are walking out of step with the culture around us. Father, help us to be those kinds of people. If we are that, we will be a blessing to this community. And in the process of doing it one with another, we will be a blessing to each other. And we want to see that happen. Help us to be that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.